Hello. Today we're going to talk about Saltcoats Castle near Gullen, uh, plus a little bit about the family history of the Livingston family, uh, the people who lived there, as it helps us to understand the building. Uh, the building was chosen because its layout is a puzzle. This is due to it being partly demolished in the 1820s. But in solving the puzzle, we'll learn a lot about how to interpret such buildings. So the things we're going to look at today, brief summary of the existing material, and there's not a lot of it, and most of it was done about a hundred years ago. A little bit about the early family and landowning, because landowning is income to build, landowning is power. And how the surviving building allows us to assess how the missing parts were arranged and how it functioned as a, a residence, a home over several centuries while also providing an adequate defence against local troublemaking. So let's look at the uh, existing written material. Um, 1590 build date is suggested, but that's based on a, a recut and out of position armorial panel. Um, it's been moved from the castle to another building. So it's some um, suspect evidence if we don't have anything else to uh, confirm the date. Uh, coats of arms, later reports say that they include uh, a boar or an otter's head. There's an origin myth that the land in the barony of Dilton was granted to Livingston for killing a boar. Margaret Menges, alias Mrs Cam Carmichael, was the last of the family in the 1700s. Spot on, the old lady died in 1776. Uh, castle was later quarried for materials to build a new steading, yeah, 1820s. McGibbon and Ross, who surveyed essentially all of the castles in Scotland in late Victorian times, called Solcoats a courtyard castle. But it's not a grand medieval courtyard castle. It's a main block with a north range and what's, what's just a yard between the two. Uh, East Lothian Antiquaries had a useful article uh, naming the lairds and their ladies. Uh, there were some gaps and misinterpretations, but that because the chap was using uh, printed paper volumes. And I looked at the same ones and I came to the same conclusions, but I had the advantage of looking at the National Records of Scotland's uh, computerised index that's easily searchable. So I found a lot more material. And there's no published genealogy for this family. Oh, so McGibbon and Ross's plan. There's a few things it uh, tells us when we look at it. The walls are very thin, which suggests a late build date. I and mean, we've got a wall there of uh, just over a metre, for instance, and that most of the walls are about that thickness. You know, um, a medieval border tower would have been eight or ten foot thick walls, you know, roughly three metres. So this is thin, thin is usually later. But there's a bit of variation in wall thickness. There's a 1.4 metre wall that's been demolished out, but you can see where it joins uh, this gable wall. And I've measured it and confirmed that it really is 1.4 metres. Um, so there might be an older building hiding in the one that we see today. No guard or road ships, no toilets. Um, that suggests after 1570s when they were using simply a, a closed stool, a bit like the sort of thing you used in, when you were caravanning in the 50s and 60s. Uh, basements vaulted, that's normal. Openings in the wall, there's, there's a variety here. We've got a slit window, bottom level, you'd expect that, and then it splays out to the light in. Uh, slit window, splays, then we've got a slit into a rectangle, which attracted my attention, and a much wider window, which I suspect is a slit that's been knocked through later when they changed use in here. Uh, but it has got some iron bars, or hard iron bars, uh, to maintain security. Um, and the kitchen, you notice the kitchen is across in the north range. 
and we'll talk about kitchens in some detail later on. So looking at it from the air, that's the track coming down from Gullen. That's two towers of the castle and a south wall. This wall here, it's essentially a garden wall. It's not a defensive wall and this area was the gardens immediately around the castle. That's the steading that uh, was built with some of the demolition stone from the castle, uh, as was that building there. And that building there has the armorial panel built into it. So after I'd been for a walk around, I sat down on a, a stone next to the castle and I wrote out a list of questions. And these are they, and we'll, uh, we'll seek to answer them as the presentation goes on. So how long had the Livingstons lived in the area? So genealogy, if we can find some, might help, heraldry might. And if they are an ancient family, where did they live before this build? if the build is 1590. How did the building work? How did it function as a, a residence, a home over several centuries? And what's going on with the frontage? We'll look at this in detail in a while. The, the tower cross-section changes, there's a gap at the end of a, an arch, and it appears to be in a much earlier style than 1590. Um, the main block, when we look at it, there's a vertical joint part way along the south wall, suggesting we might have an extension or something um, going on. Shot holes. Shot holes, these are the things built into the wall that you poke your pistol or your musket through to shoot at somebody who's trying to break into your house, castle, fortified house. Um, now normally there's one or two types, but there's multiple different types here, and we'll look at some of those and see if we can reach a conclusion about them. And how to pill, pin down a building date. Maybe the building analysis will tell us as we do this, or maybe we need some documentary backup. Um, land holdings as a source of money to build. Think about that. And perhaps other changes in family fortunes that made money available to build. So, I started with the heraldry. So this is David Lindsay, Lord Lyons Armorial, 1542, as you can see. The uh, Livingstons, that's Livingston of that ilk, in other words, Livingston of Livingston. Uh, and all the other Livingstons I found had flower motifs. Mm -hmm. Then you come to salt coats, and it's very different. We've got this red diagonal, a bend in the jargon, and we've got a head. It's not the head of a boar, it's very clearly a bear, a muzzled bear. So that uh, casts suspicion on the, the myth of uh, land granted for killing a boar. Oh, the thing to notice here is that this was originally on parchment, which was white, but it's discoloured to this yellowy colour. So this would be white, and white represents silver argent uh, when they're drawing such things. So we've got a red diagonal bend on silver, white. So that's Salcoats again. And here's the DeVoe family. They were barons of Dalton from the mid-1200s to the mid-1300s. And it is strikingly similar. You know, both are on silver backgrounds, remember, and a red diagonal. There must be some connection, some affinity there. Don't know what it is. Um, but it suggests that the Livingstons of Salcoats could have been at Salcoats for a very long time, you know, potentially back into the 1200s. Um, I wasn't the first person to point this out by any means. The chap that wrote out the um, Royal Commission's inventory of monuments in East Lothian drew attention to it and more recently a lady who held the position as the Lion Clark uh, did the same thing when she was speaking to Dalton and Gullen History Society. Now the only thing I suppose that could go wrong here is is that what the Livingstons of Salt Coats were really using? 
I'm reasonably confident they were because I found two documents, uh, Livingston documents, that had seals still attached. And you can just about see the diagonal there and a suggestion of the bear's head. Um, so this is John. The seal of his son George is rather more clear. Diagonal bear's head, you can see a, you can see a muzzle, you can see an open mouth. So I'm uh, happy that they really were using that coat of arms. So written records. The first thing we've got is a William Levingston of Saltcoats and he pops up in 1467 being granted a license to fish in the sea by George Halliburton who was then Lord Dalton. The Halliburtons took over from um, the divorce and the grant is for council and noble service and they call him a scutifer which is literally a shield bearer means he has arms sort of squire man at arms status. Um, a useful definition uh, so the term indicates service, indicates membership of and adherence to the values of knightly society. So these were people that weren't knights, but they were just the next wee bit down. We've also got Isabel, daughter of the Laird of Salcourt, which Laird, the document doesn't tell you, or documents. Um, so she married twice, married well, had children, probably William's sister, just maybe a daughter. And James, son of the Laird of Saltcoats, doesn't tell you which one again. So he's the Dean of uh, Dunkeld in 1474. 1476 is the Bishop. And 1483, the year Richard III became King in England, he died, having briefly been the Lord Chancellor of Scotland. It's probably William's brother, maybe an uncle. So they're the earliest ones, so we're talking about the you know, third quarter of the 1400s where we've got written records. Quick look at the uh, chart here. There's William. Oh, by the way, green down the side is giving you some key historical dates to just fit our interest into the wider Scottish history. Um, this John uh, died while his son was very young and William Owain here uh, was uh, appointed his, his tutor testi testimata, um, his guardian effectively, and he's the uncle of uh, John II's mother, Catherine. Her sister, Christina, Married three times, including Patrick Halliburton, the last Halliburton Lord of Dalton. Three daughters he had by his first marriage. Uh, first one married Lord Ruthen, and the third one married Care of Faddenside. Ruthen and Faddenside are names that will reoccur as we go through this story. This is Forest 1799 map with a, a map of the Livingston Holdings. So, there's Saltcote Mains Farm and all of this was arable land. There's the castle and there's parkland to the south and east of the castle. They owned the, uh, the links here. What's now Luffness links was originally Saltcote's links. They had land in Dalton as we saw them being awarded it. They had land in Willingston and Kingston and land at Hardrigs they bought in the 1540s. Now this uh, map is about how the uh, land holding changed. Let's not focus on that but rather the numbers down the right hand side. So the mains farm 161 acres, large amount of links. All the other arable we saw at the other locations uh, 438 all rented out uh, giving an income clearly. Uh, total arable, essentially 600 acres. 
And just to get a feel for what that meant, I looked at what would be the value of 600 acres uh, in East Lothian now, a couple of years ago actually, and it came to six or seven million. So this is a substantial land to hold in. Um, key thing from this slide is the initial holding at Saltcoats and Gullen was all by Ward. Ward is very old landowning type, it's essentially night service. So that again suggests they've been at Saltcoats for a long time. Now, if 1590 is a build or a rebuild date, then the people that were doing it was Patrick and his wife Marion Farsight. And they were probably thinking about it and starting building just as the Spanish Armada was sailing. So we're going to go for a walk around the castle and see what it tells us. Here's the frontage. And it's what makes it more than just a fortified house. It really is looking quite martial, quite medieval. And it mimics a medieval gatehouse, you know, two towers, they'd be much bigger on a medieval gatehouse. And they'd have a gate in the middle. We haven't got a gate in the middle. Uh, the entrance is actually around the corner there. Uh, but it's giving the impression of a medieval gatehouse. Um, it's a device that's used many places. Um, for instance, a number of Irish tower houses uh, use a, a gatehouse form. Uh, there's some asymmetry in the windows here. We've got three this side, four that side. Ah, not unusual, but there's usually a reason for it. So we'll bear that one in mind. Shot holes. You can just see a one there and a one there. Various types, some of them quite decoratively carved, intended to impress. We'll look in detail shortly. Ah, you can just see some remains of the flat roof drainage at the towers and arch poking out. Water spouts, so-called gargoyles. And what attracted my attention as an engineer was that gap that's opened up between the arch and the south tower. And the cross-section change, yeah? round to square at first floor level. So how uncommon or common is that? Does it suggest dates? So let's look at the arch. Let's see what went wrong. Now the way you normally build an arch is you're coming up with your tower. It's got nice squared stones, coins on the corner. You get to the point where you're going to spring the arch and you build the arch supporting it. And then the stone comes all the way across coast to the arch. You go to this side and you've got nicely squared coins and you've got nicely squared coins above as well. And somebody's had to cut one of those stones to cut the arch in and then they've just infilled and butted all this stone up against the tower rather than it being securely bonded together. You can only see two reasons for this. The first one is maybe the lad changed his mind and said, I've got an arch late on. I think that's unlikely. I think it's more likely that some master mason left his guys working and said, stop when you get the height where we're going to spring the arch. Came back two days later, three days later, and was upset to find they'd gone too high. So they've got two choices. Demolish part of the build, expensive, or go for the bodge fit put it in like that. And to be fair, once it was held, you wouldn't see it. But over the years, that weak point, as uh, the tower has settled, has pulled apart. So the uh, tower cross-section changes. There's a picture from Canmore, round all the way to the top, clay pots, and then they, they square it off. Um, dates are there. This is a picture I took at Burley, round to square again, slightly later date. Large diameter, gives you a nice room space, but it makes it squat and clumsy. I do think the Saltcoats towers are more elegant, although the room sizes are quite small. So, 
the round to square was about in the third and fourth quarters of the 1500s. So, openings at the base of the tower, right there. Can you see that? That looks like that. It's a quatrefoil, it's got four lobes. Nicely carved shot hole. And then we've got another one. We've got that, which is this one in a dumbbell shape. They're normally uh, up to about 1580. These ones later more decorative. Quite different though, and it's different to the stone that the others are cut out of. Makes you wonder whether there's some recycling going on from partly demolished uh, works on this site or from another site. Um, and clearly they had more shot holes than they needed because if you look above the dumbbell you can see two halves of another shot hole that's just been built in to the tower as normal building stone. It would have looked like the one in the bottom right. Looking at the south wall, the thing that seems very obvious is where the big arrow is. You've got a clear joint down there. And you can see nice uh, squared stones at one side. We're going to look in detail at that shortly. Two big windows one side. Locked now. Small window with a, another shot hole underneath called a wide mouthed shot hole. And a middling sized window. So two halves seem quite different. Oh, and there's that knock through window and the slit that has the rectangular space behind in section. So let's have a look at that in more detail. So you can see a nice clean edge squared uh, coins, cornerstones again on that side and then this side is just butting up against it but it's not squared stone. Yeah. And somebody's tried to stitch the two halves together so that the, the gap didn't open up. They've knocked a coin out and they put a long stone across there. Knocked a coin out and put another long stone across there. That's where the rectangle is behind that slit. And you can see the wide mouth shot hole in more detail there. To the left of this, we have the larger windows uh, and the back of the towers. So that's the back of the tower, and there, the south wall and the tower bonded together. It doesn't butt. There's a lot of overlapping going on between the two here. The bottom of the stair turret sits across the the tower wall and the south wall tower, uh, so that suggests that that was built in a one. Now, much of Saltcote's internal arrangements have been lost due to the demolition, right? So we're going to look at some key features of medieval domestic buildings before we attempt to interpret the clues we've got in the remains of Saltcote's internal arrangements. Now these two next two slides are quite busy but I'll take you through them and it's information that we can directly apply to the building as we go. So top left, medieval hall. Very simple, a rectangle, open hearth in the middle, two doors. There's no kitchen, uh, there's no food storage areas. Reason for no kitchen is usually given as fire risk. Uh, sometimes noise and smells are quoted as well, but the kitchen is elsewhere. If we go to the bottom left, a development, we've still got the hall with a, an open hearth. Now we've got a screen here to screen the hall from the wind in the winter time, say when the 
doors are open and that's called a screams passage and you can walk all the way through if you need to and at this end we've got uh, a private space for the Lord uh, called a withdrawing room, a parlour, solar, various terms but it's the Lord's private space yeah and at the lower end we've now got a buttery and a pantry buttery as in butts of wine or butts of beer barrels yeah uh, pantry is coming from pain, bread, but it's uh, dry foods. Kitchen, the kitchen's still somewhere else on the site. In the middle, we've got another refinement. There's the hall. There's maybe a, a dais, a raised area for the Lord's table. This solar behind. There's a screen's passage still, buttery pantry, but the kitchen's tagged on as well. So here's a real example. This is Aden Castle, which is uh, down sort of on the Cumberland, Northumberland uh, border uh, on, on the Roman wall, Hadrian's Wall. So we've got a hall, we've got a solar, we've got a kitchen, we've got the remains of some screens and another room. And it looks like that outside. And these are English Heritage's uh, pictures I'm using. So, the cutaway here uh, perhaps gives us a better feel. There's the open fire, there's a lulid vent to take the smoke away, there's a Lord's eye table, there's his solar behind. Essentially, it's a bed sit for the Lord, a private space. Now, these, these arrangements that we're talking about hold for even very complex buildings. If we go across here to this one, what we've got a great hall still we've got they're calling it a parlor there behind we've got screens passage that also allows you to move between the two courts we've got a pantry buttery kitchen so these domestic arrangements hold good for all sizes of uh, medieval gentlemanly and above uh, building uh, and even in a little border tower you know you put the hall on one level, you put the solar on the next level up. The basement, well, it might be a storage basement or um, maybe sometimes later a kitchen's moved in, uh, but often the kitchen was elsewhere. If you're interested in border towers, Smale Home is a wonderful example and there's a detailed uh, but very readable report uh, that explains the various uh, levels at Smale Home and where the kitchens were external to the tower. So, and this is why we needed to do that because the whole of the insides has been demolished. But there's quite a bit you can work out. So, the entrance area is there. Uh, you can see barrel vaulting on the ground floor. You can just see the trace of the vaulting line. You come through that entrance go under that arch, you come up a stair in the round section and out at this level and that's uh, been lit by those two big windows we saw on the south side plus the ones in between the towers. Um, I've called that a hall level and we'll discuss the reason why it's a hall level. You could go in there up to the next level and come out on a bedroom level and there was some heating up there Difficult to see, but that was a fireplace and a flue that's broken out. And instead of coming into the bedroom area, you could go into the stair turret, up again to the attic level, or up onto the viewing platform above the arch. Um, let's look at the entrance area in some details then. So, there's very little of the doorway surviving. There's one block of the uh, of a door jam that's it there and it's about there so the door jam would have been there door here first thing is as you come past it you're coming past another of those uh, quatrefoil shot holes nicely carved designed to impress it's also going to be lighting the stairs uh, as you go up those stairs it could be shot out of as well 
uh, but it's pointing well away from the door area which is really what you want to be protecting. I was quite interested in that. That is that and with thinner walls and better firearms you used to get these uh, from about 1580 people have suggested and if you simply poked your pistol into the other side of that hole it's arranged so that you're automatically firing into the door area to uh, discourage anybody who's trying to knock it in or perhaps set fire to it. So that's an interesting date, 1580-ish. Um, oh, and the armorial plaque I talked about that moved to another building, it would have been above the door, best guess, but uh, it's like that on many, many buildings. And you can just see half of that shield is salt coats then the other half is Marion Farsight. Looking back along the building, there's those two big windows that I'm calling a hall level. And if you come to there, you can see some dress stone and a, what looks like a check for a doorstop. And that's the window with shot hole above it. Looking at the bottom level, you can see the barrel vaulting again there and there's three sections of barrel vaulting the one here in this third actually runs 90 degrees opposite and so it's coming up and out towards us that's a splay from a slit window that's a splay from a slit window but that rectangle we saw on the plan that looks very much like a door when you see it here and in the same way there was a shot hole designed to protect the entrance we saw next to the tower we've got a shot hole under this window that's going to give some protection to a doorway at that position and the other half past that door check I suspect was the withdrawing room so the block doorway you can see the sides of the way through the wall and you can see blocks have been later inserted just butting up against it <clears throat> and that isn't just a, a lintel that's a solid block of stone that goes almost the whole width of the wall you can see here we've got a wall coming out towards us that's that uh, squared wall we saw a uh, squared line we saw on the south wall outside and the and then the other new piece of wall putting against it and you can see the slit window obviously um, a wider view you can see that that wall line seems to continue up So we've definitely got a blocked up door. Why we didn't see it on the other side? I think it's partially because there were, if there was decorative stone around the entrance, it was very thin because that is really what's holding it up, this giant slab of stone. And it was probably decorative stone would be robbed out to use elsewhere. Oh, yes. So the North Range of the Kitchen we mentioned before so this is a big fireplace the dotted line is the arch of the fireplace uh, now you weren't always roasting an ox in here you're often doing smaller jobs and one of the smaller jobs you might be doing is baking bread in that bread oven that which you'd heat up and then you'd rake the ashes out put the bread in and that's why there's a window here to light the work area and there's a slop drain there for getting lid, rid of uh, liquids. If we go to the main building in the east end um, and we'll compare it to the pictures here. There's the bread oven. There's that window. There's a sort of arch at each end defining the large fireplace. And that wall that's coming towards us that's the arch in front of the fire. Now, if you look at that, 
and you look at that you can almost see the same thing because it's been demolished it's much less clear and also just off this picture about there there's a blocked up slop drain you can see the the chute there probably lost a stone in front that also had a bit of a basin in for you to pour a bucket of slops in and it would drain through the wall and out so it looks like sometime we've got a kitchen moving into the basement of the main building right back to McGibbon and Ross's uh, plans we now know that that is a blocked up doorway shot hole and a window above this area with no vaulting um, is because it's a chimney space and we've had a kitchen move in. Um, so we've got a thick wall there, which is potentially older, some different phase. We've got that, that and that, and that's the wall we saw coming towards us, or the stub of a wall with a blocked up doorway in that position. So there's another building phase and then the black we looked at we looked at how that was bonded and that seems to have been built in a warner um, when we talk about how you get around this building uh, it becomes obvious that the towers uh, and that needed to be built in a warner uh, to allow movement uh, and this picture of Castle Menges, that's just to give you a feel. There's some barrel vaulting, there's a shot hole, there's a larger window further up, and this looks like it was intended to be the buttery, and there's a very narrow stair directly into the hall from this area. 1570s. So, two comparators I'm going to use. Uh, one is Munir which is Ulster Scots, but we do know they imported Scottish masons to build it. Uh, and the other one is Elko, which is uh, just across the Firth of Forth. Um, so what have we got? Kitchen area, chimney, store, store, and they've got a passageway down there. And they've got a back stair up as well as the main stair that's in the tower. No evidence of a passageway of Salcourt surviving. We'd have to start digging to find that. Elko, a grander building, belonged to an earl, but same pattern. Kitchen, store, store, passageway, back stair, as well as the grand main entrance to get things up to the hall above. And notice the dates, one before, one just a little bit after the projected date of the uh, at least modification of salt cuts. Uh, why do you want a defensible property? Well, I discovered this and I'm, I'll present these things in the order that I found them. <clears throat> so, 1597, Dorothy Stewart and uh, Andrew Kerr of Faddenside are complaining about George Livingston, who's the brother of Patrick the Laird. The quoting Act of Parliament about bearing and shooting dags, that's a heavy pistol, and pistolets, rabbit warrens and lynx. And I thought, well, shooting a few rabbits, so what? Uh, but there was a lot more than shooting the odd rabbit going on when I investigated. Some serious troublemaking indeed. So George and many others were at the lynx with long hagbuts, in, so, in other words, muskets and pistols, day and night slaying the rabbits as charged, destroying the tenants growing corn with their horses, that's rather more serious. Rags and provocations. Violently intruding themselves on the house of the complaining tenant. Indeed, they took over the house and the quote was, resting within the house, the hail, the hall of the broken men and lemans in the country thereabout. Now broken men I came across before, the sort of people who are outside the law, the sort of people who are living in Liddlesdale in the borders. Lehman's out to look up, and here's the definition. There you go. Wicked rogues, etc. Yeah, it's all telling the same story here. 
And then I found two bonds of caution. Bonds of caution are usually part of a resolution of a dispute where people put up money and say they won't bother or harm someone else and if they do they have to pay up. So there, one, 1594, that's before the trouble at the links, uh, registered by George Kerr, son of Andrew Kerr, not to harm Thomas Farside or Patrick Livingston. Quite big bonds. Andrew, 1,000 marks. His son, George, 500 pounds. Walter, who's Andrew's grandson, 500 marks. And I found another later one, 1599. Right. And this is Patrick having to put a bond of 2,000 marks up um, with Robert Farside, given surety, guaranteeing payment. Not to harm Margaret Stewart, relic of Andrew Kerr. In other words, Andrew Kerr has died. So not to marry, to harm Margaret or his son George. Perhaps they were feeling vulnerable now that the, uh, the clan leader, Andrew Kerr, had gone. But this might have been a problem originating two generations before. 1565, we've got John Livingston as the first person in a group of 12 taking out letters of the four forms, a legal device, uh, against another group of 20 headed by the Reuvens and including Andrew Kerr of Fadden side. And the charge was refrain from molesting the complainers in possession of their respective lands and in the common commonality, in other words, the common lands in around the South Lock of Dilton. And just to give you a feel for what uh, Andrew Kerr Faddenside was like, um, 1556 is reported of spulzied goods from West Fenton. I had to look that one up as well. Here's the definition. If it's reaving rather well, stolen, looted, plundered, you get the feel. Okay, but one more thing here. You see the, this Reuven and Andrew Kerr of Faddenside? They were two of the group that murdered David Rizzio, uh, Queen Mary's servant, and held the Queen herself at pistol and dagger point. So these are serious players, uh, violent, powerful people that Livingston and his group are trying to oppose. So maybe you would want a house you could defend. Right, let's look a little more at the house. Only thing I want to do here is, uh, I said there's a fireplace and a broken out flue for it there. You can see it in this uh, older picture that's at the John Gray Centre, quite clearly there. <coughs> windows. Those two big windows. They look remarkably like the windows at Elko. Uh, these windows were probably put in in the 1560s. So, gives us an idea of a date, definitely the same style. And salt coats again. Here's a window. You see the little cutouts? That's uh, indicative of there being a glass, being glass in there. And the lower half isn't, so there's probably just a shutter across that. Here's a picture I took at Blackness of a Historic Scotland restoration. There you go. Glass at the top, shutters underneath. So salt coats probably looked like that. And uh, HES again, Elko. This is a, meant to be the main hall. And there's a glass section with a shutter to close up against it and just shutters below. So, gives you a feel to what Sulcourt's window arrangements were. And, after all that, we should have a think about how it was all laid out. So, we've got the south wall, we've seen that, big window, big window, lighting I felt a hall, S small window with a shot hole, other window, and you can just see the chamfer of another window in the gable end. So, you go up the stairs from the ground floor, you come into the hall, you can go up the stairs in the other tower to the 
next floor level. Maybe a screen across there to uh, shield the hall from through traffic. Um, withdrawing room. And I suspect the door was where we saw a door check cut into the wall there. So I've given it um, a window, a window, fireplace in the middle. The main feature of halls was usually a large fireplace and I've put it in the north wall, windows either side. Uh, you could have, in theory, of put it in the centre with uh, two flues back to back. Um, it's possible. Uh, it's easier to build in gable ends and side walls than come up through the building. That's usually where they're positioned. So that's what I went with. And looking at Manier and Elko again. Here's the first floor. Come up the stairs, into the hall, big fireplace. You can go through into the drawing room, other fireplace. And there's the back stair coming up into the hall that we mentioned. Big windows, lighting the hall and the withdrawing room. Um, Elko Hall, we've called it a retiring room there. Fireplace, that small fireplace was wider, that grayed area was the original size of the fireplace. Big windows again. Fireplace in the retiring room. So, so some feel for what they looked like. So the picture on the left, that's clay pots. That's from the Scottish Castles Association. Big fireplace. Window beside it. Same form as we saw at Elko, same form as we've got at Saltcoats. Door through into the withdrawing room. Here's a picture of a withdrawing room that I took at Elko. Fireplace, big windows lighting the space. And here's Elko's hall. Fireplace closed in a little bit now. Uh, and there's HES's representation of what it looked like also. So, uh, walls could look a lot nicer, more decorative than you see these days. You know, carved wainscoting, uh, plaster ceilings. It isn't the bare, drab space that you see when you visit today. Oh, and notice these rafters going straight onto the top of that arch. It always amazes me they do that, but did exactly the same at salt coats. There's a space for a, and a space, and there's a one with a beam still in position. Or the stub of a beam at least. Now, the bedroom level above. Um, this is clay pots again, so quite well lit. Got a fireplace in the same way that uh, salt coats had at that level. Rather more uh, austere in the attic. No obvious heat sources, but you get some warmth from the wall from flues coming up, I suppose. Uh, smaller windows. But these areas probably weren't the open plan the way they see them uh, these days because they divided them up by partitions in the same way that we put partition walls in houses these days. And it does survive these partitions in a couple of places. Here's Rowan, and you've got this uh, grid work for a partition hanging from a rafter filled with cob, which is a, a clay straw mix, and then plastered on the surface to make it look good. And there's another view of the same one, that door, you go in, you've got a room with a fireplace, or there's a passage past to the next area. Balverde. Um, Balverde has uh, gone for lath and plaster. You can lath thin strips of wood. Uh, you can see the back of them there, uh, just supported by what in modern times would be two by two or three by two timber. Uh, very similar to the way the Victorians did it, if you've ever worked on a Victorian house. And then you can see it's been plastered over there. So, those areas that might seem quite large were often subdivided. Right, um, so we're going to think about how you got around the, the building in a minute, but I just wanted to show you why I picked Monia 
as a comparator. Look at the windows. Big window, smaller window, smaller window. Big, smaller, smaller again. Hmm. Fireplace on that side. Okay, it's handed the fireplaces on the left rather than the right in that one. Uh, there's a door and a door there. Door, door. Door, door. Door, door. Door. Door you can't see. Um, but the layout is surprisingly similar. You know, the masons are using sort of standard uh, building techniques and it's been applied to both buildings. Ah, we've got a new tool. All the stairs are gone except for the very base of that tower. So I've got a man to fly a, a drone over <clears throat> and I saw the outlet of the flu from that fireplace there that was expected but there's another outlet there that I wasn't oh and there's a one of the drains for the flat area above the arches and the towers nicer view um, so drone continued round oh yes before we go uh, that's the start of the stair turret so the bedroom level, it is a fireplace, you could come up the stairs into it through that door or you could come into the bottom of the stair turret that continued up. Flying the drone around a bit more, you can still see the two flues, different angle on the stair turret. Flying it around some more, there's a fireplace that's uh, been serviced by that flu. So there's a room at the top of the tower with the fireplace heated. Uh, you get this sometimes and sometimes they're uh, referred to in guidebooks as a, the laird's room or whatever which I take to me to some mean somewhere to go with a glass of something when you want to escape. Uh, there's no real proof for this but uh, a heated better quality room at the top of the tower. Looking down the towers, you can see where the tower came up, um, <clears throat> the stair came up in the south tower, the round section here. And when you get to the top of it, you can either go into the main building or you can go into the stair turret. And you can maybe just see one of the stone treads surviving there. Um, and because you go into the stair turret to go up further the level above has changed from round to square and you gain an extra room in the tower for people to use you can see that the round section internally only comes to first floor here hall level then you go into the hall and across and pick up this stairwell here Looking down this one, you can see you come up the stairs onto this landing into the hall, but not just that, there's this rough stairway up to a landing, uh, and then this irregular part round, part linear space would have been floored over to create an extra room there. Uh, there's one like it, it's Elko and they call it the steward's room on the basis that it would have been quite handy for the steward to hear anybody coming up the stairs or entering the hall uh, and it could investigate if it wasn't as expected because one of the steward's main duties was to monitor and control activities in the hall and you can see after that it changes to a square section for a room that comes in through that door you go up a level, you can see this wall thins, there's two ledges for laying timber across for the next floor level. That's the floor level for the room with the fireplace and a door in from the main uh, building's attic. So we've been to get some feel for how you move around this building. And here's my sketch of the uh, front of the building and some plans. So, you come in the entrance that's behind there, 
you go up the round section onto a landing into the hall. So ground floor through the door into the round section of the tower. You go up, you come out into the hall and go across into the other tower. Or you can go up that rough little stair we saw into that extra mezzanine room. So there's the landing into the hall, there's the extra mezzanine room. Taking advantage of the fact that the halls are always much, much higher than other room spaces, almost double height. <clears throat> now, if you're in the hall, you can then proceed up the building by going into the south tower and up. So, hall, stair up, you come up to the second floor, the bedroom level, and you can go into the main body of the building or into the stair turret, as we saw on the drone picture. You go up the stair turret, you can go into the third floor, the attic, and you can double back into that extra room they've gained by putting the stair turret there instead of having the stair in the tower. And you can continue up the stair turret onto the uh, <clears throat> flat area above the arch uh, with a parapet. That's that area there. And that's the top of the stair turret peeping out. So that's how you move that around the building. And that's why you need that whole end of the building to be intact to be able to move around the building. So what did it look like externally? Well, here's Ballancreef. If you imagine the towers were tagged on that end of Ballancreef, that's maybe what the main block behind looked like. Harled, different size windows, big windows here, <clears throat> smaller windows at a bedroom level, uh, dormers through the roof in the attic to light the attic. Sometimes you get decorative little turrets, there's uh, no, nothing surviving to that height at Saltcote, so we'd be guessing if it was adjusted. Uh, Northfield House, um, it's got a better selection of windows, that's why I put that one in. You see there's dormers at a half wall, half roof for instance. Um, so that gives you some feel for what it would have looked like with the two towers added on the left. And here's Muneer. So if that round tower had changed to a square there, you get a feel for it, how it compares to salt coats. And they have got a little turret on the corner there, still surviving. And there's a, a recreation. Yeah. <clears throat> They're suggesting a little turret on each of the other two corners, opposing the two main towers. Oh, and there's the uh, stack coming from the hall, and there's stack coming from the gable end from the withdrawing room area, and the kitchen. So, we had a set of questions. Let's review them and see if we've got some answers. So, how long had the Livingstons lived in the area? Well, definitely from the mid-1400s, we've got documentary evidence. Possibly from the mid to late 1200s, uh, based on the uh, similarity to the DeVoe shield. If they were an ancient family, where did they live before this build, 1590 build? <clears throat> and the answer is probably in an earlier version of the present structure, because we've got phasing, phases of building evident. Also, I looked at their photos. Uh, and the LIDAR, LIDAR is sort of a radar using light. And there isn't another structure in the area that could be the old castle that they abandoned when they moved into the new building. Um, or certainly none that I can, I can discern. How did it function as a residence? Well, I think we've got the layout, we know the floors, and we know how we move between floors. Uh, I think that's all reasonably certain based on comparisons to other sites and standard medieval building arrangements. And the frontage. I had questions about that. So cross-section changes, unusual but not unknown. Dates are consistent with the 1590 date. The gap at the end, 
end of the arch appears to be set settlement uh, causing a gap to open up at the weak point that was created by the construction issue we discussed. Uh, the early gatehouse style, that's what makes it more than the typical fortified house such as Ballancreef. Uh, it seems to be harking back to earlier more martial times so maybe it's reminding people that the Livingstons had had a long presence at Saltcoats, uh, you know something they'd want to remind people of for reasons of their local prestige. Oh the main block, the vertical joint etc. Well we've covered that, we've talked about essentially the new front half with the towers uh, being to the west to the left of that vertical joint and uh, a kitchen moving into the basement also. Shot holes, well certainly there's some decorative ones, there's some quite business-like ones, various types and there's obviously some recycling going on and some just being used as building stone when they'd used the ones uh, all the filled all the positions they needed to have shot holes in. Build date. We'll look at the next slide for a bit of detail on that. Land holdings as a source of money to build. Well, the land could be providing enough income uh, to, f to build over a four or five year period. Uh, there is detail on that but far too much detail to go into here. Um, wondered whether there's other changes in family fortunes making money available to build? Well, the only thing I found was there's some very large loans outstanding at Patrick's death in 1612. 2,000 Berks and two loans of 500. Reasons unknown but perhaps it was a combination of money from revenue, money from the land rental and some loans uh, to do the building work. Speculation. And build dates. So no guard robes after 1570, certainly for the, the front tower end of the building. Round to square transitions, certainly they were being built in the third quarter of the 1500s, that fits reasonably with the 1590 armorial panel date. Manea, many comparable features. 1618 is a known build date. Uh, memorial plaque, yeah, probably is a recut, given that we've got other things confirming 1590. And Patrick was the laird from 1587. Probably got married between 85 and 87, based on his elder child's life. And he definitely married Marion by 1589, when she's named as his wife in a charter. So, we have a potential build period of 1587-1585 through to 1590. Sufficient time to add a new front. And that armorial panel, it doesn't record a marriage because we know he was married earlier than 1590, definitely by 1589, probably two or three years earlier. So maybe that plaque and its date marks the end of a building project. And here's a wee summary. But this is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening and I hope that you can take some of the things we've looked at and apply them to other sites that you visit.